The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. The old man's head was covered in mantises. At first, Luke thought it was a wig or some weird toupee, but he was at the southern tip of Guam, a few miles from the Pacific, and the man was wearing tattered clothes and what looked like strips of old radial tires lashed to his feet. Why bother with a toupee? So begins The Deep by Nick Cutter. This episode on... Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. Hey everybody, and welcome to episode four. This is Michael T. Bradley. This is Skiggs Maddox. And with me in the intro there, that is Colby R. Rice. So hey, special Colby. thanks to her for helping us out. So we're here today to talk about The Deep by Nick Cutter, uh, which is a, a great horror author name if there ever was one, right? Well, it's a pen name, so yeah. You just had to ruin it, Skiggs. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, it's a great a great name for a horror writer. Let's begin with a basic plot synopsis. Skix, do you want to start us out there? Okay. There is a plague of memory loss on the planet. In search for a cure, scientists discover at the bottom of the ocean something they're calling ambrosia, which seems to heal, repair, and revive people and, and an animal and perhaps even lead to immortality for some reason they think this will help with their brain stuff so they have this eight miles down laboratory set up scientists in there start uh, going wonky and so our hero gets called down there to to go in and help because he's the uh, younger brother of the the head scientist who is so far the least wonky or at least still able to talk and once he gets down there, things go crazy. <laughs> I think the only thing that I would add to that is that the name of the disease, the name that they've given it is the Getz, which uh, just so in case we reference it, you'll know what's going on. Let's and see, trigger warnings? short for, for Getz. Is that what it is? Yeah. I never, I never connected that. Oh, or yep. if they say it, I must have accidentally skimmed it. So trigger warnings. Uh, animal cruelty again. Yeah. Child abuse, possibly sure. sexual abuse, would you say? Yeah. I'd say. Pretty heavily implied, uh, yeah. for sure, even if not uh, explicit. As usual, and again, I'll just keep mentioning the format for at least, I don't know, the first half dozen or so of these. We're going to do the good, the bad, and the ugly. In the good, we'll talk about what we liked. The bad, we'll talk about what we didn't like. And in the ugly, we're going to talk about the monster at the end of the book. And dun, dun, dun. when we're talking about the end of the book, yeah, there are going to be spoilers. Good and the bad, we'll try to keep it decently spoiler free but probably some things are going to come up so for the good good i think the setting is really interesting and and the the setting of which is kind of submarine base submarine slash i mean it's not really a submarine it's yeah, but essentially imagine a submarine that's a that's a base on right? the it's, bottom of the ocean in, in the marianas trench so uh it's it's deeper than currently we tend to hang out and it's it's made in this sort of weird octopusoid fashion with tubes and tunnels and stuff so basically like deep space nine but mm. really far in, in in the ocean far down in the ocean it could so easily be a space story yeah you would change almost nothing to make it a space story I, I so i love the setting it's interesting in cutter's descriptions it sounds interesting it smells interesting it's vivid the description there are some illogical things about it that annoy the hell out of me but um i can sort of blink and forget them I think the concept of this this ambrosia stuff actually seeming to be a conscious entity or put out by a conscious entity, and that that's sort of the the space alien style aspect, uh, the concept of being under under the water so deep for so long drives people mad whether pushed along by the ambrosia or not is not entirely clear, and I think they were mad to begin with. I think that's that's pretty strongly implied. So it's interesting. The, the plague of forgetfulness is totally irrelevant to the story. They they didn't yeah. need it, but it's interesting. It's kind of it's kind of neat. For me, my biggest like about this was the atmosphere. I felt that Nick did this great job of really making you feel like you were in this enclosed space. Like there was this, like it it almost immediately. Once Luke, our main character, arrives at, in the Trieste, the, the base station, or, yeah, the base, I wanted him to get the hell out, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, 
it just felt like god this is this is a bad idea you even, know even uh, on the way down he started having bad flashbacks which kind of presaged that it would be uh, not only a bad idea but it would be digging into his past to be down there this book so much reminded me of a movie that i love 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 event horizon sam neill and Lawrence fishburne uh, and a spaceship that everybody thought it disappeared like it, it it did this sort of test run of this what was supposed to be faster than light travel and it just disappeared and then you know many many years it shows up again and so this is kind of the crew that goes out to look at it and find out what happened and essentially as soon as people get onto the ship they start getting terrible images from their past and terrible images of possible futures mm. Uh, and the atmosphere, and I won't spoil why it's happening, uh, it's different than the answer to the deep, so knowing one won't spoil the other, but the, uh, you know, just immediately being on the ship, it's like, something is wrong here, something is bad, we we should get out of here, this is, you know, we're, we're tampering in God's domain, or what have you, right? right? Uh, so I felt like, uh, this book did a really good job of that. I mean, the setting's interesting. The setting feels very unique. It's kind of like, yeah, it, it basically should be a space station story, but making it way down in the deep makes it feel even more alien somehow. In, in my notes, I call it Solaris meets It. <laughs> I don't know how familiar you are with Solaris, but that's on a space station over a planet that has a sentient yeah. uh, ocean that creates these sort of people out of out of the memories of the the astronauts yeah definitely for sure <laughs> and it of course right and, and stephen king's got a blurb right on the cover of the book so they're aware of each other it's definitely obvious that cutter is a king fan which fair enough you're writing horror and any time starting in the past 20 years you're going to be aware of stephen king yeah. right um that's kind of unavoidable. I mean, even King stuff has started to sound kind of like older King stuff at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, actually. Which I, you know, you you just you you put out that much work and it's going to influence people. So there were times where I was like, "Oh, come on now." And then I was like, "Well, but what are you going to do?" You know? Right. Uh also, I really liked Al. I didn't so much connect with most of the characters, but for some reason, I really liked Al. Like I just felt like I could picture her really well and she kind of seemed to have her head screwed on straight as opposed to every other damn character uh, and i wanted to you know see how she would kind of face things i i mentioned in passing that she had the most description of anyone and that that's it's kind of a standard thing that if you're not paying attention to it you're, it just rolls off and you don't even notice this happening that in a lot of uh, straight people books um <laughs> The, the the if if there's only one woman then she gets the 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 top to bottom you know what she's wearing what her scar looks like what her hair looks like what her you know uh, and the, the guys are generally just like some generic guy which it, it really stood out I didn't dislike her but I thought she was kind of flat we she didn't feel as well rounded as as the of course the only other two real characters are Luke and Clayton and they get flashbacks constantly so we know all about them. True. I thought Al stood out. Uh, let, let's say I thought she had uh, the most potential. She had an interesting scar that that that, that, was, <laughs> that was never explained. That seemed like a Chekhov's gun to me. You know, they spent a lot of time on that scar. I said she had potential, and you say she has a scar, and it reminds me of Sam and, Simon Amstel's bit about, is she interesting, or does she just have short hair? <laughs> All right, so so let's let's talk about the bad. Let's talk about the the bad, the things that we didn't like so much that aren't necessarily related to spoiler, just uh, style or things that happen along the way. First, the layout of the lab is stupid. <laughs> it just is it isn't. I I never really envisioned it. They violated a couple times, like you know, left and right and up and down, and you know he's he's got his back to the wall and then he backs up a few steps. And it might be intentional that they want it to be a little dreamy and weird. I don't know. That that would work in a movie. I'm not sure it works in the book. Uh, and the, the crawl ways are just ridiculous ways to get around. They have to, like, crawl on their back in these narrow little tunnels. Yeah, and, and, and they were created for these science types. It's not like a military right. base or anything. It's and, and it's this thing that they've spent millions of dollars and lots of time on and many nations together building this too yeah and they decided that these kind of like 
I don't know. I pictured them as almost like uh, something like asbestos covered interior, like these these little holes you have to slide through to get from one section to the other. And I'm like, how did they get supplies through? Like they were like, okay, if things went bad and some sort of supernatural presence were to take over the base, what would be the best thing that we could do to to facilitate that you know something like nice and claustrophobic it didn't seem to make any sense also greased with silicone lubricant which i think made me laugh those whole sections i felt like were just added to amp up the terror but i just felt obviously it's the only reason they were added so they were right. so unnecessary as an aside the the lab is brand new but it felt old it felt falling apart it? definitely which is kind of an interesting thing to pull off sure my my second beef, it might seem in opposition to what I said earlier, the language and description is really vivid. And there are many passages where it seems like the vivid part was written by a bot or something. Um, <laughs> it's like, here are some interesting words that go together. Especially when it gets into sound description, like, schlick went the throbbing, bumbling... You know, and, and it's just like, that's not the sound that goes with the movement that you're describing. But, you know, some of it's interesting. In, in in writing, a lot of writers can do this. They'll, they'll describe something in an unusual way, and you sort of have to pause and go, I can see the way in which that makes sense. And sometimes it seemed to me that Nick Cutter was just throwing a random word in there because someone bet him to see if he could use, <laughs> you know... <laughs> It reminds me of an It, like somebody laughed when I read, I, 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 I did an audiobook of It when I was 18, because I've been an audio geek forever and uh, loved horror for a long time, and uh, there's a section in there where Tom describes kissing Beverly as like, what was it, like licking an antique ashtray or something? Uh -huh. and, and it just, and it's like, what? You know, like, who thinks that way? I'm currently reading The Troop, which is Cutter's first book, because I, I enjoyed The Deep well enough that I'm curious to read more of Cutter's stuff, and, and it was a, a free audiobook listen uh, at my library, so I'm currently listening to it on the way back and forth from work. Uh, the Troop was written before The Deep, and I think he's toned down in The Deep, but there's so many times oh. in The Troop where there are these ridiculous things like, you know, like the taste was like that, I can't remember the word, but it's like plasticine covered leaf from the middle of the rainforest, and it's like, what? <laughs> How am I supposed to imagine that, Nick? What are you fucking going, you know, like, just say bitter, Jesus. And it just seems like he loves doing that. Like, like a, a good writer can pull off similes and metaphors so that you associate things in different ways in your head. And at times it just feels like he's like, okay, I can't just go for the obvious here, so I've got to make a really good simile. And, and then like six hours later, he's thought of this thing that maybe works, but you have to stop and think about it so long that you're thrown out of the story. They're, they're always interesting, but they don't always work. And listening to it in an audio form <laughs> makes it even worse, because then, you know, you don't have time to stop it. It's just gone by, right? right. That was the third thing. See, I lost my notes because my computer died. Mm. Luke is a veterinarian, yeah. right? So everyone he's talking to are scientists except for Al. So in one of our zillions of flashbacks, Luke's baby wakes up crying in the middle of the night, and there's a millipede in his jumper. Mm -hmm. So... Luke, the character, rips the, the millipede out and squashes him, calling it an insect, repeatedly. And I know a veterinarian knows that millipedes are not insects. Oh, they aren't? No, no, they're not. Because insects all have six legs. Worse, and this is something I, I had to look up to double check because I thought it sounded so stupid. If you remember, the millipede was biting the baby. Mm -hmm. Millipedes do not bite. There's no biting millipede. And the author should have known that. Like, like at that point, we don't know what the, what the the monster at the end of the book, what it is. And so I assumed, it was like, I know millipedes don't bite, but obviously it was doing something to the baby. And, you know, maybe that was whatever monster this is marking the baby or something, right? Which the baby's, bit Luke, though. the baby's Zach. Oh, did it bite Luke? Well, yeah, I mean, the author, or not the author, the character especially, right. should have known millipedes don't bite and been like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I could see just being like, that's weird, and scene. Yeah, just one line would have solved everything. Like, I've never seen that happen before. And it was a big millipede. It's not the sort that crawls into your house and into your child either. So, I mean, it 
suspicious. My other bad, which is also going to kind of sort of segue into uh, the ugly, but my other bad is that goddamn near nothing in this book means anything. <laughs> the gets, like that whole, right. you know, the first maybe five or six percent of the book is setting up this entire kind of interesting post-apocalyptic world mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. different than most that we've seen, right? It's not zombies. It's it's basically Alzheimer's run amok. And, and, and catchy. And and it's like, that's kind of an interesting world. You, you literally could have had nothing. It could just be, oh, your brother's this genius and we haven't been able to hear from him in a while and he's in this experimental laboratory mm -hmm. uh, and he's asked for you. And, and, and it could have... The, the whole gets thing could have not been there. If I were writing it, and it's not always a fair way to judge, but if I were writing it, I would have started the story on the descent. I, I, I think that's where, where the, the story itself starts happening. The gets is a writing prompt. It's interesting as hell, but not the game of it. And telling the rest in flashback, you mean? No, that would uh, be silly, putting in flashbacks. No, he <laughs> never writes flashbacks. <laughs> then there's the human shield thing. So as, as a kid, right. Luke wanted to be the human shield. And that was kind of what he viewed himself as. It Superhero was, persona. Yeah, a friend of mine once made, on, in City of Heroes, made a Bucky character. And all he could do was take bullets and he would just yell in front of other people and yell, Out of the way, Cap! And so <laughs> I kind of viewed him as that, but a slightly more serious version. And that never leads anywhere. And it's not even a good metaphor for how he resolves the, the conflict. He, well, that, exactly. He doesn't saying, sacrifice doesn't... himself like that. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't mean anything. The the abuse doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's horrible. There are lots of really horrible scenes that are well yeah, written. Uh, there is a recurring image of bees and hives, mm -hmm. and that doesn't lead anywhere except some interesting images. Yeah, uh, all of these things I thought were going to tie together. And then... Or the dog. Re yeah. Remember when I said we, we were talking and I wasn't done reading and I said, I'm betting anything. The dog is a Trojan horse. Not really, no. Which, which, if we haven't mentioned it before, another big king influence, there's a magical dog in this, right? Um, <laughs> that's a big king thing. There's always a magical dog. It's because there were no yeah. Negroes, gays, disabled people. <laughs> they should have shipped one down on one of the little submersibles, like... Uh, uh, we heard there was trouble down there. We're sending you down a magical Negro with folksy advice. That Strom Thurmond there is there because that <laughs> is the name of a trope kind of poking fun, not because that's actually an okay thing to call people. Right. The dog, LB, um, he, uh, that just literally doesn't go anywhere. And I think I think I want to use that to go ahead and segue into the ugly. All right, so spoilers, beware. So it's it. It's literally the, the answer is literally the monster at the end of it. It's it's Pennywise unveiled. It's these like it, I mean there are two of them and they're like creatures from outside of time and space who crash landed here long ago and they're wanting to like fuck with people because they're bored basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. They don't tie into the gets. Nope. They don't tie into anything else. They the dog. They could have Oh my god. That fucking dog death. <laughs> the uh, or the well Ooh, and it was so... All right, here's the closest thing uh, we had to foreshadowing was going down, we knew there were two dogs, but then we only see one dog. We never talk about the second dog. And then, shock horror, a dog approaches and it turns out not to be our dog. It's the other dog who's more possessed. <laughs> it's not effective because we haven't been wondering about the other dog. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. I was just like, ah, oh, it's weird. Okay, so this reminded me of the book uh, As She Climbed Across the Table by Jonathan Lethem. Uh, these holes start appearing, and voices are being heard through these holes. Uh, in, like, the walls, not out of the dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that'd be cool. And everybody who encounters one of the holes is kind of tempted to put parts of themselves through it. Like, it's, you know, it's this dark desire, right? You know one of the dudes would have put his dick in if it were real life. <laughs> and they might have, who knows? Mm, fair. The dog, uh, LB, eventually gets swallowed up by one of these holes, and that death scene is the most overwrought, ridiculous scene I think I have ever read. Like, like even to, I hope she's dead now. 
<laughs> I kept giggling through that scene, and it's totally not the, the reaction that he wanted there, no. because it's supposed to be super tragic, and, you know, our, our magical dog companion is being sacrificed to hell or something. And sort of mutated on the way, and in terrible pain, and looking at her with his please, pleading eyes. <laughs> the story did exactly what I think it meant to do, which is, I was like, I can't wait till we go through that hole and see what's on the other side, right? Yeah, like, this entire story felt like it was building up to Luke is going to sacrifice himself to save the entire planet, and that's, like, that's where this is building, but, but the kind of how we get there and everything, that's that's what's going to be fascinating. And there's this whole scene with the bees, the beehive. It's like taking over this room and it makes this, you know, kind of Lovecraftian, defies space yeah. uh, temple. I, I love the, the Cthulhu bees. They were great. Yeah, we're going to go through that and we're going to see this other world and we're going to enter a hole and find out how this all ties together. So promising. And instead, the end is uh, because, okay... The biggest thing that our main character is dealing with is that his son, Zack, was stolen from him, what, seven years ago at this point? Something like something that? Something like that. And he's dealing with that, you know, and it's ruined his marriage, and it's ruined so much of his life, and blah, yada, yada, blah, yada. Blah. And we find out that these it creatures stole his son. Probably, unless they're lying. I, I suppose. I guess it could have just been a simulacra of some sort. For no real apparent reason. They were just setting Luke up as if it were obvious that by stealing his child seven years later, he would go down in a submersible and be with his brother. <laughs> My thought was, why couldn't they have infected, say, the handyman who came down and who ended up dying sure. in the craft? Why couldn't they have affected, infected Clayton and made him say... Oh, I have a medical issue, I need to come up. There were obviously people shuttling supplies and stuff back and forth. I mean, they'd been down there long enough, and Al had been up and down a few times, she said. Right, so it seems like if you have this much foresight, I mean, like a, like nearly a decade's worth of foresight, couldn't you have just been like, uh, no, I guess I guess we don't really need this guy. I don't, I don't know what just we were thinking. Just float a blob of the shit up to the surface. It doesn't even need to be in a body, does it? I don't... Or a fish! Yeah, I infect a fish! So, no. Whatever you infect becomes immortal, so it doesn't even matter if you get a deep-sea fish going to the surface. And beyond that, so I mean, so essentially the end of the book is just, you know, it has an unhappy ending. Essentially, this monster that Luke has become, because he's now infected with, you know, this evil consciousness, goes up to the surface and that's where it ends. But I'm like, most of the human race is gone anyway. This isn't even, like, it's just a big who cares at this point, I know. Right? I mean, that, depending on how you read it, uh, Wilkinson came back to life. Wilkinson was a scientist who died, got all mutated by the goo, was brought back up to the surface. And then since we've been out of touch with the surface this whole time, like that's a big deal or something, Wilkinson apparently came back to life and destroyed everything, and maybe everything was already infected up there. Did he? I don't even remember that part. You can read it that way. I, I actually looked up some discussion of the book. There's a little bit of debate on the matter, but it seems like, like people uh, are of the opinion that Wilkinson rose again, which is in keeping with what Ambrosia does. Sure. Uh, and the reason they were out of contact was because he had sort of taken over the, the ship. Yeah, that's... And that was another interesting setting. Yeah, so Wilkinson's story seems... More interesting than Luke's, honestly. <laughs> yeah. This is, I'm, I'm glad I didn't mention it during the good, because I think it's better to mention it here. One of the best things I ever, I think, is that our monsters, up until the very end, when we find out exactly what they are, are referred to as the fig men. Because Zack misunderstands when, it, you know, he says there's monsters in the closet, and his dad says, no, 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 they're just figments of your imagination. And he says, fig men? And I was like, oh my god, I cannot believe some famous horror book or movie out there has not done this before because it's so brilliant like the fig men are coming to get yeah. right i thought that was such a great little moment and then that just doesn't Nothing. really lead anywhere everything in this book is like interesting imagery but overall i just felt like it kind of added up to a bunch of like I'm going to chew my food and open my mouth at you. I want to cut it apart into different sections and give it to a writing class and, and use these interesting images as, as prompts. It, it's, it's the literary version of, like, a music video. It's, it's yeah. really good to look at. It's really interesting. It's really fun, but it's really meaningless. So it's like The Lost Boys. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. Lost Boys is one of my favorite music videos. I, I don't care what anybody says. 
Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. I also think The Deep would adapt to a movie well. Definitely. I, I think if I had put, like, 90 minutes of my life into this rather than, I don't know, 10 hours or whatever, I, I would have come out enjoying it a lot more. A lot of good body horror. You know, horror movies especially, you don't necessarily expect them to mean anything in the end, right? I mean, when they do, it's an added bonus, but... You just want to see some scary things, you know, whether it's gory or, or you know, whatever your style of scary is. But, uh, as you can probably tell from the fact that I'm listening to the troupe still, I, I think Cutter shows a lot of potential and a lot of promise. Because there were a couple of scenes in here that really got to me for a moment. Uh, it, it's just... There are so many scenes and there's so many flashbacks and so many of them didn't get to me. Like the fucking trunk with the clowns on it. Oh my god, that that went on forever and it wasn't scary at all. And the section where we briefly run into a different... There's, there, there's one other scientist besides Clayton down there when he goes down and he's acting all crazy. And we briefly have an encounter with him and this didn't make sense in the book. And so trying to explain it isn't going to make sense, but he is murdered by the room yeah <laughs> yeah the, it the doesn't cause kind of, structural collapse yeah it, uh, I, i'm imagining it in film it would be you know just very cheap cgi the 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 ceiling kind of bending down and swooshing him like a bug it reminded me of certain things in like nightmare on elm street where the walls become bendy right, and things right, like right. that but it doesn't work at all and it just felt like what was the point of that whole scene you could have just had clayton impart this information yeah, we, uh, or we didn't care about him we weren't yeah. missing him like when we first arrived they're like "Ooh, maybe it's that guy and we never hear from him we never wonder about him we never hear about his story uh and then he shows up and then he's a little crazy and then he's killed and then we go on with our lives with nothing changed except that that room is squished. Speaking of characters who don't go anywhere, the reason that I ended with saying Al I thought showed a lot of potential is that it never goes anywhere. Oh, right. Nothing's ever right. done with it. She just... I don't even remember how she dies, but it's just like she dies. She dies off screen, which is disappointing because as a main character, I think she at least deserved one of the interesting deaths. But she... When he came back to the, the shuttle, she was dead. Probably dead. Missing. And he saw her face in an ambrosia blob. So he thinks that was her, but we don't know for sure. It really just felt like this could have been a really cool short story, or maybe novella, but but it's like 420 pages or so of essentially scary location and everything dies. I, I mean, that's not enough to string us along that long for, I don't think. Right. Would you recommend this to other people, Skix? Actually, for all the tearing apart, I would, but I would warn them that they're looking at a meaningless music video of a horror thing that has some great sets, set pieces, moments of action, and body horror. I feel exactly the same way. I, w I don't think I would phrase it that way. I would just say, I, I mean, I just, I would only really recommend it to people who I knew who were really into horror. I would not use this as like an intro to horror. <laughs> if you will. Right. Uh, but yeah, if I knew somebody who liked horror, I'd be like, yeah, this is really good because it's got a lot of great moments. This is actually uh, a good sort of reading for, for folks like me who are into the haunted houses because they are at best a bunch of scary moments and set pieces that make no sense together. <laughs> so like there are things in, in this book that I, I would love to replicate, probably never could do so convincingly, but the, the plot fails. Almost everything but the plot <laughs> is fine. Definitely let us know what you think. It's bees. Dread, period, dialectic at gmail.com. Send us feedback, you know, whatever uh, place you're seeing this or listening to this, feel free to leave comments or feedback there as well. Send it attached to an articulated blob of ambrosia. <laughs> if you have your own horror, yes. novella or novel that you think you would like to hear us uh, give our take on, then please also feel free to send it in. Again, that's dread, period, dialectic, at gmail.com. And we're going to try to look at anything that comes our way. Please, uh, feedback is more than appreciated. It is welcomed and encouraged. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Skix Maddox. And we are... <laughs>